start recording. All right, hi everybody. My name is Kari Kwas. I am with the Snohomish Conservation District. Tonight we are going to talk detention pond awareness, um, specifically for the city of Granite Falls. Although what Derek's going to cover tonight really covers the gamut. <laughs> They're mostly the same across um, anywhere there's a homeowners association. And so we will go through all of those. So with me tonight is Derek Hahn, our, uh, one of our engineers at the district. And the two of us will be your uh, host this evening. So I am Kari Quas, Community Engagement Project Manager. If you have any questions about um, stuff at the district, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you'll find me at the plant sale if you got plants. There's all kinds of different places I show up, um, but mainly I've been on Zoom. So I'm glad that you're here this evening to uh, join us for this topic. And tonight I will be fielding the question. So if something comes up during the presentation, feel free to ask. Um, Derek doesn't mind the interruption. In fact, he likes that. So it just um, helps him with the flow and make sure we don't miss anything. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A or if you have any technical issues, put those in the chat. And then also we are recording this. And so we will be able to share this out later. So if you miss something, then you can go back and watch it. So you'll have that in your email uh, later this week. So quickly what a conservation district is, and we're really glad that you can be here tonight because this is a partnership with the City of Granite Falls and the Conservation District, and we do different things. Um, so the Conservation District is one of 45 across the state of Washington. We are mandate like a fire district, but we're a special district uh, to protect natural resources so we can serve. So what that means for you um, and then people in the HOAs in Granite Falls pay into a rate. So you'll see us on your tax statements, $8 and eight cents probably um, for your house. But we can come out and provide free technical assistance. We can do site visits. We do education like this on a variety of topics. But we are just trying to look at your property, um, see what you want to do, and provide advice and best practices. We are non-regulatory. It's all voluntary working with us. Um, so feel free to ask us questions. If you're even hesitant, like, I, I don't want to ask the city, well, feel free to ask us. We there's kind of a line there where the, the safe people to talk to if you ever just don't know, by all means, um, that's what a conservation district can do and help you with. But we are stepping up our work in Granite Falls. It's been rather fun the last couple of years. Um, we had been working there doing like lawns to lettuce, but now we've um, upped the game. So we've had more opportunities to do with the uh, Granite Falls Community Coalition and do some raised beds and compost and things there. But this year we're focusing on uh, detention ponds, which again, with the HOAs in town, there's like about 500 houses or so that support five different um, detention ponds. And so we're trying to let you know <laughs> what they're about um, and then what your responsibilities are and how you can work with them. Also, uh, we do youth education. I always want to push that. We have an art contest coming up. And if you have students in the schools, make sure that they get the district out for free lessons. So you may see this sign a little bit about, but I'm going to let Derek be our expert on detention ponds. But it is something we are focusing on this year. Um, Charles White, who works for the city of Granite Falls, he's our operations supervisor, sends his, sends his regrets. He cannot join us this evening, um, but that's his contact information. I will send it out after the fact, um, but we will be in touch uh, with Charles. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Derek because he's the guy that actually knows what these things do. <laughs> and he's our one of our engineers. He's been at the district for 11 years, I believe now and had really helped to get rain gardens off the ground in Snohomish County, had brought the Veterans Conservation Corps crew to us, had just some fun ideas. So he's a, he's a smart technical guy, but he also has a creative mind. So um, feel free to ask him questions tonight as we go through the um, uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Gary. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> my name's Derek. Um, so for tonight, we're pretty small. So please uh, feel free to ask questions. It's actually easier with a small group to, to keep it more personal and just ask whatever questions come up. Uh, it does help me um, to uh, with my flow a little bit if, if you just kind of talk back to me as, I, as I'm going through this. I prefer not to lecture if I can't avoid it, but um, it seems to happen a lot over Zoom. Um, yeah, so I've been a stormwater engineer for 16 years been with the district for 11, coming up on 12. Um, 
And uh, I was in the private sector for a couple of years uh, and I designed large detention facilities. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of go through the science and the philosophy of those, why they exist and then what your obligations are. Um, but first we're going to start with uh, the stormwater in general and the stormwater problem and uh, why we put the detention ponds in, uh, in all modern development to begin with. Um, <clears throat> so next slide. Uh, so 100 years ago, everything in our area looked like this. It was all very densely forested and you had many layers of, of vegetation. So you had an upper layer by trees, you had a middle layer from bushes, you had a lower layer by ground cover. The ground was very, very soft and absorbed water very easily. Everything was kind of light and fluffy. So when a raindrop fell out of the sky, it hit a leaf and that hit another leaf and that hit another leaf. And every time it hit a leaf, a little bit of it evaporates back up in the atmosphere uh, to the point that very little, about only about half the water actually makes it down into the ground. And then when it hits the ground, it would soak into the really soft, nice soils. Um, and this created an atmosphere where our creeks just didn't run very strongly. Uh, water made its way very, very, very slowly to the Puget Sound. Um, and that's the way it had been for millennia. Uh, and then we came in and started developing. Next slide. <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah, so here's, a, here's an example of, of what it looked like. So about 50% of the water never really reaches the ground and goes right back up in the atmosphere. And then, and then 35% of the water soaks into that nice soft soil. So really only about 15% of the water makes its way to uh, nearby water bodies. And then we came in and started developing and we put down what's called impervious area. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, that sheds water. So there's no vegetation. So we get very little evaporation effect. Only about 15% of the water that hits uh, an impervious surface goes back up into the atmosphere. Uh, and then we've capped off uh, that nice soft soil. In many cases, we've actually scraped it off. So modern developers come in, the first thing they do is they scrape the entire site down to hard pan. So they take off that nice soil. They actually turn around and sell it in most cases um, as topsoil. Uh, and so uh, because of the way that the glaciers came through, that hard pan basically functions like concrete. So water won't soak into it, it runs off. And then we come in and on top of that, we put uh, pavement, uh, Asphalt, concrete, roofs, gravel. Actually, gravel is impervious. A lot of people tend to think that water will flow through gravel, but gravel is actually put down and designed so that it, it will shed water. It won't uh, let water through. Uh, so that means more and more and more of that water ends up going to, um, to the nearby streams and the nearby creeks. This is that funky slide. Um, so you can just hit forward a bunch of times and we'll talk through it, sorry. Um, so uh, one of the problems that it causes is flooding. So you can see in the upper corner, uh, upper left corner. Uh, this is kind of like, I, I use the analogy of I-5. Um, <clears throat> if everybody's trying to get on I-5 at the same time, everything backs up into the on-ramps. Same thing with stormwater. If, uh, if all the water is trying to rush really quickly to the same spot, uh, everything backs up. So the valley backs up, our pipes back up, the storm drains back up, we get water in our basements. Um, so that's that's one of the consequences of putting in new impervious area and removing the forest. Uh, the other thing is soil erosion. So as that water is moving, it's moving faster and faster and faster, and it's picking up particles of soil and depositing it downstream. So our uh, rivers and creeks and streams are getting straighter and moving faster and cutting themselves deeper and deeper and deeper. And then all of that soil that was picked up is carried by the water and deposited into the Puget Sound. Uh, it also is a massive source of pollution. Uh, the number one source of pollution of Puget Sound is from stormwater uh, because the stormwater picks up oils and garbage and trash and heavy metals and brake dust and all the nasty stuff that uh, lives in our environment and washes it to the downstream. There's no filtration device after it goes into a catch basin, unlike uh, sewage water. So sewage water goes to a treatment facility where it's treated and then released to the downstream in a much cleaner condition. Uh, we do not do that with stormwater. Um, so everything that is picked up by stormwater is washed to the nearby creek uh, and, and causes pollution. And then finally, we end up with issues with groundwater because our aquifers used to be recharged, 
by all that water going into the soil and then soaking down into our deep aquifers. But we've capped off all of that. So we no longer get water into our aquifers. So we're effectively mining our aquifers with our wells. Uh, we keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper wells and pulling up the water that's not being replenished. So these are the problems that are caused by all this development and, um, and pervious surface. This is a standard catch basin. Uh, this is what you see in the environment. And this is where most of our water goes. Uh, and it's connected by a network of pipes that moves very, very quickly to the nearest downstream and usually outlets into a creek or a river uh, or may sometimes directly into the Puget Sound. And again, gets no, uh, very little um, treatment in most cases and, uh, and uh, is not slowed down. This is what they look like from the top uh, before they go in the ground. They're just big concrete boxes and you punch a hole in the side to put a pipe through. So what was the solution to that? So uh, starting in the 80s and then accelerating uh, over the last uh, 40 years, we started using a detention. And the idea of this is you dig a really big pond and it helps to store water um, and release it much slower to the downstream. So we don't have all, as many of these problems. Um, and this, uh, the model, so the sizing of how big these needs to be uh, is based on some fairly complicated engineering. Uh, but basically what we found over the years is um, our models uh, were really outdated. So we kept updating the size of the detention. So the detention ponds have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but uh, to the point where we're kind of finally close to the point of how big they actually need to be in order to replicate those forested conditions that we used to have. But we have all this infrastructure uh, that was designed prior to that uh, where these ponds are too small. Um, so in most cases around our area, we're releasing water to the downstream faster than, than it really should be. Uh, but even so, some of these facilities are very, very large and they hold a really large amount of water. Um, they're designed for the 100 year storm uh, or they were historically, now they're designed for two consecutive 50 year storms uh, to be able to hold the volume of that entire storm from all the impervious area on the upstream. Um, an alternative to this is called bioretention or rain garden, and that's what I specialize in. Uh, I've, uh, under the conservation district, seen about 300 of these installed all over the county. Uh, the idea of this is that you're building a little miniature forest on your property. Uh, so we put in nice soft soils like are in a forest. Uh, we put in a mulch layer like the debris layer in a forest. We put in native plants and we send all the impervious, the water from the impervious area to this rain garden. Uh, and it infiltrates down into the uh, native water table uh, like uh, it has been for millennia uh, before us. Um, this, is a, this is called uh, GSI or Green Stormwater Infrastructure. It's something we're trying to implement more and more of around the Puget Sound area, um, but it's uh, definitely not keeping up with the pace of development. Um, so we, we really could use a lot more of this, uh, which is part of my job. But um, in general, if you're interested in something like this, uh, I can talk to you about, uh, about uh, how you can install bioretention or a rain garden on your property. Um, I will mention, uh, because you do pay the tax assessment or the, the rates and charges um, uh, in, the, your in your taxes, on your property taxes, I am available to come out and talk to you about all of this stuff on your property. Uh, honestly, I would recommend it. You've already paid for it, so you might as well take advantage of a service that you've already paid for. Um, and I can come out and talk to you about any of these things. I can talk to you about maintenance. Sometimes it's really helpful for someone to just kind of talk through uh, how they want to approach an issue on their property. And, and I am available to do that. So I, I would recommend that you guys um, set that up. You just send me an email. My contact info will be available at the end. Send me an email and we can set up a time for me to come um, look at these systems for you. Uh, the other thing that happens in these ponds is usually some type of treatment. Uh, the most common type of treatment that we use around here is called a cartridge filter. This is basically just a giant Brita filter. Uh, they put a whole bunch of these in a big concrete box and uh, they send water to it and it helps remove all the pollutants and, and extra nutrients from the water before it goes to the downstream. Uh, one of the downsides of this is these cartridges are supposed to be replaced every three years. And very rarely do we find that they're replaced on the accurate schedule. Uh, and they plug up like a Brita filter will plug up. Um, so this is something that you guys need to be aware of. One of the issues with these is they tend to be underground. So it's very common for 
HOAs to not even know that they have these systems or that they're obligated to be maintaining them or replacing the cartridges. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you find out if you have one of these uh, a little bit later, but if, this is something to think about. Um, there are There is detention and there is retention. Uh, uh, sometimes these uh, phrases are used interchangeably, but they're not really interchangeable. Detention means that you're holding the volume and then releasing it to the downstream at a very slow rate. And retention means you're holding the volume and letting it infiltrate into the native soil. Um, given the way the regulations are written and how we do things around here, uh, it's pretty rare for us to have retention ponds in our area. Most of our systems end up being detention. Um, so uh, I'd say maybe one out of 50 of these systems is actual retention where it infiltrates in the ground as opposed to just overflowing to the downstream. So, um, just so you know, there is a difference between those two phrases. So every detention pond has an access ramp. This is usually a gravel uh, ramp that you can drive a vehicle down in, into. It has an inlet pipe for the water to come from the upstream and then an outlet, uh, which is usually a fairly complicated control system that lets water out at different, uh, different flow rates at different times. Uh, there's a pond bottom. Sometimes these bottoms of detention ponds are designed to be wet all the time, and sometimes they're designed to be dry all the time. Uh, and it's actually important to know which is which. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to tell what yours is supposed to be. It has an emergency overflow. So uh, if something plugs up in the outlet and the pond gets too full, it has a safe place to overflow. This is usually just a low spot in the side of the pond. Um, that'll direct water in a way that it won't uh, flood the houses nearby. And then it also, oftentimes has berms kind of dividing the rain garden into different cells. Uh, you very often will see some type of catch basin uh, associated with these. Uh, most commonly, you will see a catch basin on the downstream end. Uh, and this is what we call a control structure. And this is, uh, there's a, there's a device inside of it that releases the water at a metered rate. And those are almost always type two catch basins. Um, uh, and this is closer to what a manhole would be. So it's round and it's a large diameter and it's usually very deep. You can see here, this is a, clearly a very complicated uh, drawing, but this is what it looks like, what the control structure looks like. And basically it's a vertical pipe and there's a number, either a number of downturned elbows or there's a very, uh, carefully manufactured notch in the side of the pipe that allows water to be released at certain rates. Um, I will note here, uh, I think I talk about this later, but I might as well point out now, um, that there is an emergency release valve uh, on the side of that. Uh, you can see the handle kind of coming up to the, uh, yeah, up to the lid of the manhole. And that is if, in case you need to drain the entire pond, um, for an emergency situation, you can pull that and drain everything. However, it's very common for uh, these to be left open uh, and they really should not be left open. The pond cannot function as intended and there's risk of doing fairly significant damage to the downstream. So one of the first things that I usually look for when I'm inspecting a detention system is, uh, is that valve closed? Um, and uh, it's not uncommon for me to find people that have pulled it open and wired it shut. Uh, are wired it open uh, because they uh, they don't want water in the pond, but it but the water needs to be in the pond. Uh, so so that's something to to look out for. <clears throat> uh, the most of these have some type of fence or security around them. These are not always attractive. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's been uh, a bit of a uh, some people tend to call these things stormwater prisons because they use fairly ugly cyclone fencing around the perimeter. I will say there are often other alternative ways of doing it other than this type of fencing. This is usually just standard procedure for most developers to put these up. Uh, so if you don't like the way they look, uh, there are other options. And sometimes some of these actually don't need fences, but they have them just because that's what everybody does. So um, if, if you do want to look into taking down the fence or putting up an alternate fence, that's a little more aesthetically pleasing. Um, again, you can talk to me about that and we can determine if your pond might be viable for something like that. That's probably the, one of the biggest complaints I get about these stormwater ponds is the fence around the, around the perimeter. 
So uh, on when is the fence required? Um, it's uh, usually required if the side slopes of the pond are, are more than three to one. So um, say the pond is six feet deep. Um, and so that means that the um, that you need an 18 foot run up the slope in order to um, in order to have that three to one slope. And if it's steeper than that, then by law you are required to have some kind of fence around it. Um, let's see. Uh, in addition to detention ponds, sometimes there are detention vaults. And this is basically just an underground pond uh, that's made out of concrete. Uh, some of these are very large. I will also say it's not uncommon for some HOAs to not even know that they have a detention vault, or if they do, they don't know how big it is or where it's located because it's buried underground. And it's not something that they think about. Um, so we're gonna get into uh, figuring out how to tell what type of facility you have on your property. <clears throat> Uh, this is some of them being built. You can see some of them are extremely large. Um, they have to, some of the larger developments have to hold really, really large volumes of water to the point that I've seen some that were constructed that could hold a 747 inside of them. Um, so this can get very, very expensive, obviously. Um, and it's uh, I will say it's uh, and the reason that you're here at this workshop is it's really important to maintain these facilities because some of these facilities are more than a million dollars in infrastructure um, and you really do not want them to fail um, and there are significant amounts of damage that can happen if you're not in there maintaining them um, and that could end up costing the hoa quite a bit of money so uh, i do encourage everybody to know where these are how they operate how they're supposed to be maintained because this is a really large i mean a lot of the value of your the home they own um, is in the value of this facility so it's really something that you want to pay attention to and take care of. <clears throat> um, it's very common for these uh, for these facilities to have plants in them. It's important uh, that these be planted with as many natives as possible. It's very common for these to be really taken over by invasive species. Uh, oftentimes, the the vegetation in these has not been maintained for a very long time, so they're full of blackberry. English ivy, Scotch broom, that type of thing. Um, and uh, and they sh really should be maintained so that they have more native um, uh, plants. Uh, it will ensure the, uh, the longevity and the function of the pond a lot better. Uh, again, I mentioned the treatment cartridge filters. This is kind of what they look like on the inside. They're just a big fancy uh, activated carbon, silver bromide, um, uh, filter. Uh, uh, these are very, very heavy. They usually require a professional in order to be changed. Um, so, and and they, like I said, they really are supposed to be changed every three years. So, um, if it's uh, something that you don't aren't aware of, uh, it's really something that you should look into and 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 monitor and figure out when the last time these were maintained was. Uh, another option is a bioswale. A bioswale is real similar to a rain garden, like I showed you before. Uh, the same type of really nice soils are used in the bioswale. And the idea is that you're using the soils as a filtration device. Uh, these are usually located upstream or downstream of your detention pond or vault. Um, and, uh, and again, they need to be maintained with native plants. They need to be mulched and make sure that they're operating uh, well. Uh, there's other forms of treatment. This is a Felterra device on the left, which is just a uh, treatment system with a tree that they put in it. Um, and then uh, the one on the right is a vortex treatment facility that's designed to settle up, to settle sediment that comes into the system. Uh, so it just spins it and sends it down and then you can suck it out with a vector truck. So in addition to the cartridge filters and the, and the ponds and vaults, there's other things that may or may not be located on your property. And these will all be shown in the drainage plans. <clears throat> so uh, something that may come up is they in these documents um, that uh, you may or may not have that we're going to encourage you to get, uh, there'll be references to upstream and downstream treatment facility. Uh, so upstream treatment just means that the filtration happens before it goes into the pond and downstream treatment means that it happens after it goes into the pond. All right, uh, let's stop there for a minute before we get too much deeper into the maintenance. Do we have any questions? Does anybody, uh, that was a lot of content very quick. 
Um, so uh, let's take a minute to catch up. Yeah. Everybody still with us? Give us cool. Heck yes. On those filters, I mean, how how big is that? Like human size height, big? They're, I think they're about 18 inches in diameter and they're about 24 inches tall. Okay. But they weigh 80 to 100 pounds each. Mm -hmm. So they, they yeah, they you, you, you need a crane in order to get them out. So. And just as an aside, the native plants piece, we do a plant sale, although we're, it's sold out or we're closed for this year, but we are a um, vendor that can help with getting native plants. Um, so there is a question. So why are the HOAs responsible for all of this? Yep, that's a very good and common question. So that is the way we do modern development is uh, your development is located on private property and the way the titles are written uh, uh, have put the obligation on the HOA. Uh, that is usually not something everybody is very excited to hear about, uh, but uh, that's the way uh, uh, we've decided to set things up. Um, it's not uncommon for people to have a fairly strong emotional reaction to uh, this news. And I understand that. Uh, and I understand the frustration of that. Um, don't shoot the messenger. But, uh, but it, that just kind of is the way it is. Uh, and um, there, trust me, there's been a lot of people that uh, have spent a lot of time litigating this and trying to figure out ways around it. And to date, no one's figured it out. So um, it's just part of the, um, it's part of the cost of being part of the HOA. Um, yeah, so, and pretty much at the beginning of this, probably 2006, 2007, when they really started implementing this more in mass, there were some cities that took on the maintenance, uh, but they quickly moved the liability for that. So I think as of now, there are no um, cities or jurisdictions that do the maintenance on private property. It's all done. Uh, and it's regulated through the Department of Ecology. So in order to, there's a permit that's, uh, that is released called the NPDES permit that all cities and counties have to operate under um, for stormwater. And that, that's a permit they have to get from the Department of Ecology. And in order to do that, uh, they have to ensure that these systems are maintained properly. And again, it's written on the title of pretty much all of, uh, all of your houses in the HOA title that you are obligated uh, to take on the maintenance of these systems. So two other questions, Derek. Um, uh, Angela says also because cities or other jurisdictions cannot absorb the installation and maintenance expense without raising rates um, past, where rate, past where rate payers will accept. Yes, that's true too. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And I would suppose then hopefully the HOA is in place so that way the cost could be borne by multiple homes. I think that's the other part of this too. And you'll hear it from Derek. I've already caught it a couple of times, but the earlier intervention help it helps or um, it will help reduce costs because then it won't be so far gone. So he'll get into that. Um, another question is um, my biggest concern are the filters. How do we go about getting these inspected and how and find out how much it will be to replace? Yeah, so the, you have to figure out the manufacturer. By and large, the most common manufacturer is Contec, C-O-N-T-E-C-H. Um, and you call one of the representatives and they will look you up in their system. i tell you when uh, the last time I was inspected and replaced was. So uh, you, it, that will be, one of the things we're going to get into is that, um, you need to find both the stormwater plans and the stormwater report for your development. Uh, it's very common for most HOAs to not have either of those documents. And all of the legal obligations, all of the function of the system, all of the, the design, all of that information, like the manufacturer of the filter, is located in those plans. Um, so uh, basically what you need to do is you need to go to the city. They will have records of those documents and you need to get copies of those um, I will say uh, these plans are things that were created by professional engineers and they were created, created for review by the city and they were not created for easy interpretation by the homeowners. Um, so it can be very challenging sometimes for people to understand what the plans say and what they're obligated to do. 
Uh, so again, I'm available. Uh, I can sit down with you. We can go through the plans. I can explain how it was designed, why it was designed that way, um, and and help you figure out what you're obligated you know, to do. So yeah, this is not a terribly fun presentation to do because it's not good news for most people that are watching. Uh, and I am aware of that. Um, so, uh, uh, and I'm sensitive to, to the frustration uh, that a lot of people feel at being surprised that this is something they're obligated to. Uh, but again, it's it's legally on your title uh, and it's something that uh, that's probably, I will say it's, it's not going away, it's only accelerating. Department of Ecology has been getting more and more aggressive at getting these facilities uh, maintained, largely because they have several billion dollars of inf infrastructure that hasn't been maintained as regularly as it should be. Um, and, and really the health of the entire area depends on these systems being maintained properly. Um, so the health of the Puget Sound, the health of all our rivers and creeks, the health of the property of your downstream neighbor, uh, all depends on these systems working well. Um, and I, it's very common for me to do site visits to people who are getting regularly flooded out um, by people upstream of them that are not doing adequate maintenance. So this is, it's a really deeply communal issue uh, that everybody needs to be part of. Um, and it's, it's not one of those things that, that you can kind of isolate yourself on. Um, it's, a, it's a really big regional issue. Yep. So uh, other, are there other questions? That's it for now. Okay, let's get into detention pond maintenance. So um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so again, what uh, are your legal requirements? Um, so one is to figure out what you own. So this will be on your title. This will also be on those stormwater plans uh, and it will delineate what is public land and what is private land. The vast majority of these are located entirely on private land, um, uh, but, but it's important to figure that out because some of these are a little bit weird. Some of these are nuanced. Um, I've done a couple of visits lately, one more recently in the city of Lake Stevens, um, where it's written in the, in, on the title and in the stormwater plans that the HOA is responsible for maintaining the pond, but there is no HOA. Um, there never was an HOA and there was never one created. So these things can get complicated and, and a little bit tricky legally. Um, so, um, but again, uh, it's something that's coming and the quicker you get on this, uh, the, the easier it's going to be for you. Um, what condition is it in? Uh, so if it hasn't been maintained in a decade or two, it may need a pretty significant infusion of funds at the beginning to get it up and running. And then after that, it gets cheaper and cheaper um, as you maintain it yearly. Um, what jurisdiction are you in? Um, I'm assuming most of you are in the city of Granite Falls, um, but if you're not, you're probably uh, just outside. So you may be in the county and there are different rules. There are different people you're gonna talk to. There are different places to go for questions, um, depending on where you're located. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, there are some things that can be done by just the homeowners, depending on your capability. And there are some things that you're going to need to hire a contractor for. The biggest one that you'll need to hire a contractor for is confined space work. So we are talking about the control structure and that big type two catch basin. It's basically a manhole. Uh, you need to be confined space certified in order to get into the manhole. Basically what happens is a lot of gases that are not oxygenated build up in that manhole just because we've got things decomposing in there. Uh, and so there may not be oxygen down there. So please don't climb down into one of these manholes to see what they look like. Um, uh, you need someone that is certified in order to go down and, um, and look at the condition of the control structure inside of this. Um, sometimes the vegetation gets very large uh, even native plants sometimes can grow really, really big and they can af affect the function of the facility. So those need to be mitigated, uh, usually cut down, uh, sometimes uh, revegetated in areas. Um, and that may need to be done by a professional. Um, there can be very steep slopes on some of these. Again, some of these ponds are very large and the slopes down into the middle can be quite steep. Um, so you may need somebody who's certified uh, to work on uh, steeper slopes who may need to use belay equipment or that type of thing. Uh, there can be very deep water in some of these places. Um, you may need heavy equipment, especially if there's large amounts of sediment removal that needs to be done. 
uh, or there may be vectoring. Vectoring is basically just a giant wet vacuum that's on the back of a truck and they come in and, and, and suck a bunch of stuff up. It's used to maintain catch basins and pond bottoms and that type of thing. Um, so, uh, and, and that's also an, another thing that usually has to be hired out. Um, so what dictates what you're obligated to? So most of the rules that you are required to follow come from the Stormwater Management Manual for Western Washington. That is a large document that the Department of Ecology uh, puts out and they update that every couple of years. And that dictates uh, the sizing of all of this, how it functions, what the maintenance requirements are, all that type of stuff. Um, or alternatively, there may be separate county or city municipal codes that you're also obligated to. Some cities have slightly different uh, rules, uh, more stringent, slightly less stringent. Um, so uh, something I will cover a little bit later, but we can talk about now is it's important to have some kind of really good relationship with the person at the city who's managing this for you. So Charles is, is the person that you guys are going to be working with. I would recommend uh, you contacting him uh, and, and he will help you understand what you are obligated to from a city municipal uh, standpoint. Uh, so things that need to be done to maintain vegetation, most commonly trimming and mowing. Uh, again, there may be some invasive species um, that need to come out. Uh, some species are more invasive than others. Uh, blackberry is a nuisance, but in the long term, it's not terribly detrimental. But things like knotweed uh, or hog, hogweed or something like that can be uh, uh, incredibly detrimental. And also there are some instances of where things can be uh, toxic. Um, so that is something that uh, needs to be uh, have an eye kept on. Uh, the other thing is green waste. Uh, there's leaves falling off of trees. There's things left after mowing. There's debris uh, that will eventually fill up the, um, the detention facility and that needs to be cleaned out every once in a while. So the control structure, that's that complicated drawing that we saw earlier. Uh, the pieces of that, there's a manhole lid uh, that's usually very heavy and you need a special tool in order to open. Uh, there's the manhole structure, which is the concrete sides. There's the orifices or the notched weirs, which are the, the elbows with the holes that go up and down that, that internal vertical pipe. Um, there's that emergency gate valve. There is a ladder that goes up and down. Um, and then at the very bottom of that control structure, there is a plate with a hole drilled in the bottom. That's called the bottom orifice. Um, that one's really important because it controls most of the flow through the pond. And it's the one that's most likely to be plugged up. Um, and then there is an emergency overflow over the top in case the pond gets too high. Um, and then oftentimes within the control structure, there is some type of sediment or debris storage in the bottom that should need to be pulled out or sucked out every once in a while. Here's a question that came in. Um, what about cattails? Cattails. So cattails are, they are a native, but they are really a nuisance when it comes to stormwater ponds because they put off all that fluff. And the fluff can really plug up. So we're just talking about the orifices and the notches. That fluff has just an amazing way of getting in and plugging up those orifices and notches. So where we can, we encourage people to try and keep those down as much as possible. Or it's not enough usually to just pull them out because they'll just grow back. So they usually need to be replaced with something that's also a native uh, that will do well in those wet conditions. So irises or, or brushes or something like that that will take the place of those cattails. So from a from an invasive species, they're not considered invasive, but from just a general nuisance perspective, uh, they can be a problem. So. Does reed canary grass grow in these things too? Yes, reed canary, canary grass grows a lot in these things. Uh, and it that is invasive. Um, the, honestly, cattails are probably worse than reed canary grass though, is kind of the way they work because the cattails plug things up. Uh, re reed canary grass is not good for uh, drainage paths like creeks and rivers and that type of thing, but in ponds they tend to be fairly harmless. And once it's in there, it's kind of a little bit hard to get out. So uh, I'd probably focus on other things first before I got really panicky about the reed canary grass. And in, in a detention pond, in other situations they can be much worse, but in a detention pond, there's usually other things to take care of first. Thanks. 
So again, here's that picture of that control structure. You can see on the top left that downturned elbow with the orifice cut on the bottom. And those are the things that tend to plug up over time if the facility is not uh, inspected and maintained uh, often enough. Uh, another common issue is trash and debris. Some, you know, just general trash tends to float and gets, again, it gets picked up by the stormwater, goes down the, the catch basin and then into the pond. So uh, making sure that the pipes are clear. Uh, sometimes a lot of these have trash racks on them to keep animals out um, and to keep things from floating in, but that can also plug up from water coming from the upstream, catching uh, debris. Uh, over time, sediment just kind of fills the pipes, so those need to be cleaned out every once in a while. Um, and uh, and there, the pond will fill over time with sedimentation. And another thing you need to look out for is erosion. If something that used to be fairly stable all of a sudden starts to be eaten away, uh, you may need to come in and rebuild that. Um, uh, I will say in terms of maintenance, trash and debris is usually one of the easier things uh, to do in the pond. So, and this is typically something that uh, a designated person and a resident in a HOA could go get in there and do themselves. Uh, so what does failure look like? Uh, failure looks like flooding. Uh, so if that pond is just over full all the time and all of a sudden it's overflowing, uh, it looks like pollution. So if you see you know, an oil slip over the top, if you see lots of flat floating debris, um, over vegetation, which we've covered, Sedimentation, so it just fills up with sediment over time. Uh, slope failure, again, that's that erosion or, or something's, you know, things are moving. This should be a static system. It shouldn't be moving around. Um, so if there are soils moving, uh, that's not good. Short circuiting, this is a situation in which the overflow and the, uh, the, the inlet and the outlet are very close to each other and something happens inside so that the water basically comes in and immediately leaves because it hits the overflow pipe. Um, and then um, and then it, it's failing if it's not ponding at all. So if it is clearly supposed to be a pond and it rains really hard and you just don't see any ponding in there, uh, that's also a type of failure. All right, and then we have a question, Derek. Um, are the inspections done automatically or is this something the HOA needs to request? The HOA, yes, is something that the HOA needs to request, I believe. I, Every city does it different, but I believe Granite Falls. Again, um, I will get in, talk, uh, in touch with Charles and, uh, and set something up. Um, uh, but most of the time, um, historically what's happened is that there's just been a letter sent to the HOA, but oftentimes that uh, isn't passed to the correct parties. Um, and that happens once a year. Um, but more and more as regulations are coming down and they're emphasizing maintenance of these type of things, um, it's really a relationship that's established between you and the city uh, and, and scheduling to have these things uh, maintained. Okay. Thanks. Um, hiring some tips on hiring a contractor. Uh, you may need to hire different contractors for different types of jobs. Uh, however, more and more, it seems like there are contractors appearing that specialize in just this and do have kind of an all-in-one inclusive package ability. Um, you want them to be licensed and insured, not just somebody who decides they want to do this um, just for liability per, uh, reasons. Previous experience is pretty important. So you want to ask some questions about other things that they've maintained um, because some of this, the activities in this are do require some ex experience, some expertise. Uh, asking for references and, is important and getting multiple quotes. I would recommend that as well. Um, talk to at least three different contractors and make sure you get your quotes together. And then, um, and then we, were, we are gonna talk briefly about budgeting for this in a later slide. Uh, inspection and reporting, uh, like I said, uh, contacting the city or the county. And then every HOA really should have uh, someone who's doing documentation of when this happens, because you do want to have a record um, and not just saying this is when it happened, um, uh, that you can that you can prove. And I'm, honestly, I'd probably take pictures right after the um, right after the uh, maintenance, so that you can prove that you did it. Um, what documentations are required? So keeping notes, pictures, like I just mentioned, uh, and then those existing reports and plans are really, really, really important. Um, so again, uh, contact Charles. Um, he can help you get through the records room, 
find those drainage reports and uh, drainage plans if you do not have them and get those to the HOA so, so that all the, part, all the parties um, are there to, uh, and, and are in agreement of what exists and what needs to be done. So someone commented as someone representing a municipal entity, please contact us to share who the point of contact is for your HOA. Uh, so typical costs for detention ponds, uh, for the wet ponds, this is kind of total general cost, you know, 1750 to $35 per cubic meter of, um, of uh, volume. Um, and that's something that, again, we would find in the plants, and that's about 50 cents to a dollar per cubic foot. Um, the size of these is all over the place, so it's really hard to give you uh, a total price on that. Um, you kind of have to figure out the volume. Um, and then, and then dry ponds, ponds that are dry during the summer, uh, use about $10 or about, uh, yeah, $10 per square meter. Um, uh, it gets, it does get a little bit cheaper per square meter if you have a larger pond. So about half that for a larger pond. Uh, and again, these are very vague numbers. So some ponds are going to need a lot of maintenance and that could be fairly expensive. Some ponds are just going to need some touch up here and there. Um, so yeah, so these are, again, just some estimates. Routine maintenance is about three to five percent of the construction cost annual. That's a little bit hard to, to know if you don't know what the, the cost of the facility was. Uh, maybe a better number. Um, uh, yeah, just talking about mowing, two to six hundred dollars a visit, uh, but in really intensive maintenance. Um, uh, this is assuming that you don't need any real strong initial maintenance. If you're doing it every year, it can be up to about a thousand dollars a year. Uh, and again, you can reduce the cost of all this stuff by doing uh, regular maintenance. It's one of those things that the longer you let it go, the more it costs to get things started again. Uh, removing sediments about fifty to one hundred dollars a yard, and that would include digging it out and disposing of it. Um, and just to get started on a dredge job, it's usually about four thousand dollars. Uh, somewhere in that range. Um, repairing structures can be pretty significantly variable. Uh, if there is significant damage to say concrete structure, it can be a lot more expensive than if it's an earthen structure and you can just patch over the top of it with some soil. Um, and I will say some of this work that you need to do may require permits, but again, um, working with your municipality will help um, for you figure out if you need a permit or not. Uh, there are a couple of resources. Are we going to send out the link to this? Um, yes, we are. Yep. So you guys will have this so you don't have to memorize this uh, <laughs> obscure link. Uh, um, again, so working with the municipality, identify your inspector. So Char uh, Charles is going to be your guy. Uh, Try to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, don't over complicate them. The city has a lot of these things to maintain. They like simplicity too. Um, uh, keeping good records is really, really important. Uh, maintaining a good working relationship with the city and county. Sometimes it can be very frustrating dealing with these issues and things can get very emotional, um, but it really helps if you treat this like a partnership um, because the, this, the city's scrambling a lot of this stuff too. So. They'll appreciate your patience and, and cooperation uh, on, on getting this done. And then knowing who to talk to, again, that's um, Charles is your guy. So that, easy for you guys. We can tell you who to, who to work with. Um, so resources to do uh, research on this, uh, city or county records. Again, if you're in the city of Granite Falls, I'd go to talk to Charles, get into the record room, find all the things that exist. Uh, there are a bunch of really good mapping tools now. Uh, IMOP and Scopy and uh, Snohomish County PDS has a really nice interactive map now. You can turn on all kinds of layers and figure out what is on your property. So I recommend those. That drainage report and drainage plans are really essential to getting this done. Uh, the stormwater management manual, that's a pretty dense, thick, intense manual. But if you're kind of nerdy like that and you really want to get into the details, you can absolutely do that. Um, maintenance agreements are really important uh, things for you to find. Um, 
there may be auditor inspector files, uh, Google Maps, and then at the bottom, the Snohomish Conservation District. So again, I'll, I'll reiterate, we are available to help with a lot of these things. I know a lot of this stuff feels really overwhelming and sometimes surprising, and we can show up and be a third party, neutral party that has no skin in the game. And we're non-regulatory, which means we can't get you into trouble. And we're voluntary, which means if you get really upset with us and tell us to leave your property, we have to go. So, um, so yeah, we're just a, a nice, easy third party to work with. And, uh, and, and again, you're already paying for our services. So um, I would recommend that you set up a time for us to meet with you. All right, we've got eight minutes for questions. So I know that was a lot. It's pretty uh, dense material. It's hard to cover in an hour, uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully we got through it okay. And you guys just let me know what questions you have. None yet. Okay. <laughs> I would just read, oh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked, who would we contact for Monroe? I would start with Public Works, um, Vince. Uh, Vince uh, Bertrand. Yeah, Bertrand um, would be where I would. Great. Also, Debbie Knight, I believe, is there too. And she, she's also really easy to work with. I've worked with both of them in the past, and they're both great. Mm -hmm. And then um, one's in unincorporated Snohomish County. Who should they contact? Yeah, so that one, I'd probably just start with the records room. So public works records request, uh, you can do all of that online. They'll even email you the results. Um, and that would probably be the best place to start. Um, and then uh, I just do a general call to PDS, Planning and Development Services, and they will connect you to whoever uh, will be assigned to you to, to help you with inspections. I'm typing some of these into the chat. Um, PDS, no co. And then Three Lakes area. Yeah, that would also be on Incorporated County, likely. So, so yeah, that would start at the records room and then and then call PDS. Mm -hmm. And then just to look for guidance and direction, um, should we contact you or Charles? We are in Granite Falls. Probably start with Charles, and then, or I mean, you could do both. Either way, yeah. you, could, you could just send out an email and include us and him at the same time putting Derek's email in the chat and I will add in Charles too. And I would say, I think I just echo what Derek said, everyone that we work with at the city is very kind and they have tough jobs too. So if we can alleviate or help, um, we sort of bounce off each other. And so we're just all trying to work for good ultimately uh, for the environment and water quality because when these work well, they work well for all of us. Um, another, let's see, statement. The Snohomish County Service Water Management Group is an excellent place to start. Yep. Uh, the drainage manual they have posted on their website is excellent. Thanks for that, Angela. Any other questions? does not look like it. Yeah. Um, so just uh, final thoughts from me, I will be sending out this video. So you'll be able to watch it again. And please share with your neighbors. <laughs> um, everyone in I think five different HOAs in Granite Falls received postcards. So everyone should be aware of this. And I think you'll, this won't be the last time you hear about this, certainly, um, as we work through and have Derek out uh, to your places. We can also set up as we have in the past, like a um, in-person, maybe a few homes or something, a gathering um, to just talk about the pond that may be closer to your house as opposed to another or something, but just to answer questions in an informal way, not this kind of presentation, but at least now you have a baseline for what you might ask. Um, so you can go back and look at it. And then I will also include the links from the chat, contact information for Charles, for Derek, uh, myself, in case you have other questions unrelated to this. Um, and then we can uh, follow up with you uh, throughout this year. But by all means, reach out. That's why we're doing this. Um, and it is on our radar for 2022. Heidi says, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah.
This was great. Thank you, says someone else. So yeah, great job, Derek. Um, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, but we'll give you five minutes of your evening back and um, look for an email from me. Today is Tuesday, right? <laughs> so probably by uh, Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the info, says M. Pettit. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, Derek, have a nice evening and everybody else. And we'll see you again, hopefully pretty soon. Thanks, Carrie. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great night, everybody.